Dallin lecturer. I was fortunate enough uh, to be a colleague of Alex Dallin uh, here at Stanford and indeed of uh, his wife, Gay Lapidus, um, and to benefit from his guidance and to witness at close quarters um, the profound and beneficial effect he had on Soviet and East European studies, not only at Stanford, but in, in the country at large. He set very high standards of scholarship, and he approached the study of the Soviet Union and Russia with an inquiring and, and critical mind. I have also had the very good fortune to know uh, tonight's speaker, Vlad Zubok, for many years. Uh, we were trying to reconstruct at lunchtime today exactly when we had met, and I think it was in 1987 in Moscow at a conference on the history of the Cold War, the first Soviet-American conference on the history of the Cold War and uh, a harbinger of, the, of changes to come. And it was clear at that meeting, at least that's in my recollection, that here was uh, a young scholar uh, who was willing to uh, attack and criticize uh, not only the uh, Soviet shibboleths about the Cold War, but also the American shibboleths, and somebody of independent uh, mind and trenchant judgment. And in 1991, uh, I was very fortunate that Vlad came to Stanford for a quarter and we taught a seminar together on, nu I think, nuclear weapons and the Cold War. Um, born and educated in Moscow, uh, Vlad moved to the U.S. in 1993 and held a number of positions here in this country, but now he's a professor of international history at the London School of Economics. He has made major contributions to our understanding of the Soviet Union in the Cold War, and more recently, to our understanding of the intellectual history and intellectual life of the Soviet Union and of Russia. His book, ins which he wrote with uh, Konstantin Pleshakov, uh, Inside the Kremlin's Cold War from Stalin to Khrushchev, which appeared in the mid-90s, opened up uh, a vast array of new materials coming from uh, Russian archives, which were, had opened up in a dramatic way in the early 1990s. His book, A Failed Empire, the Soviet Union from Stalin to Gorbachev provides a masterly analysis uh, of the failure of the Soviet Empire and the history of the Soviet Union after World War II, uh, and in particular of the Brezhnev years that I found especially uh, kind of revealing and insightful. Uh, he then published uh, some years ago uh, a book called Dr. Zhivago's Children, The Last Russian Intelligentsia, which provides an illuminating history, both inspiring and I think ultimately dismaying uh, of the Russian intelligentsia in the period after World War II and the fate of the intelligentsia. And earlier this year, he published a book on uh, an intellectual not widely known, I think, in the West, but of immense importance in the history of 20th century Russia, namely Dmitry Likhachev. And the book's title, The Idea of Russia, points to this crucial topic that's being addressed to, through the biography of that remarkable man. So that has covered a wide range of topics. Um, and he's also been involved in, in a very important um, documentary series uh, the CNN uh, series on the Cold War that Jeremy Isaacs put together in the mid-1990s, 24 hours. It's a wonderful series, uh, very useful for teaching. Uh, and he was uh, the main Russian uh, consultant uh, on that uh, particular project. Um, his work has won uh, many prizes, the Lionel Gelber Prize, the Marshall Schulman Prize, uh, and also a prize from the Society of American Foreign Policy for the editing of documents. Yeah, so Vlad has contributed greatly. His writings, I think, are notable, not only for the wide range of research 
on which they are based, but also for his ability to draw strong conclusions that deserve to be taken very seriously. And that is why I'm looking forward so much to this evening's lecture. Yeah. Thank you, David, for um, a wonderful and moving uh, introduction. Thank you, all the guests. Thank you, Chris uh, and uh, Gail, for inviting me for this momentous occasion. I, uh, I'm in a sort of uh, time machine in reverse because my mind is in 1991 when it was the first stay outside the Soviet Union for four months for me, a Soviet citizen, um, and that was Stanford. California, uh, and that was the time uh, when momentous changes uh, happened in the Soviet Union. So in early uh, December 1990, I came to Stanford, and in, in mid-December 1990, uh, sec uh, Foreign Minister of the Soviet Union, Eduard Shevardnadze, dramatically resigned, warning that the dictatorship was coming. He didn't mean somebody like Vladimir Putin today. <laughs> Uh, and everybody began to guess what kind of dictatorship he was having in mind because at that time Mikhail Gorbachev was still the head of the Soviet Union. And, but the country was in a profound uh, disarray. Uh, so uh, for four months uh, here in Encina Hall and elsewhere in CSAC, the Center for Arms Control and International Security, we watched uh, CNN and uh, other television programs in astonishment not expecting what would come next day, next week, um, from the Soviet Union. And I guess those days, uh, for me, uh, shaped forever my uh, interest in that uh, story, uh, of which I was a, 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 a witness uh, among uh, other colleagues. And none of us had a, not, a, not even imperfect, explanation, why it was happening, what was happening, and all of a sudden, why so rapidly the Soviet Union that had looked immovable just a few years earlier was beginning to uh, disintegrate. So um, I remember the voices of that time. I remember actually Alexander Dahlin. It was a vibrant, remarkable group of people at Stanford and Berkeley. Uh, talking uh, among themselves, talking to a broader audience about the enigma of Soviet reforms and why they were clearly failing. And some of those scholars actually believed the reforms were succeeding beyond belief, yet for some reason the state was failing and there was no more. So it is in the spirit of those wonderful uh, discussions and conversation, it is in the spirit of what uh, Alexander Dahlin uh, said uh, at that time uh, that I will speak today. The spirit is not to talk about the conclusions that existed for, uh, for a long period of time that are held by a considerable number of people, but instead of deconstructing, sorry for the word, um, addressing critically op with open mind those held views, held conclusions, and adding more complexity and asking new questions. So if we um, go forward with, uh, with the slides, a couple of slides, which is probably one more. The first view that I want to uh, present for your attention, and, and it, is, it is held by a number of uh, um, established scholars, or at least it was held of when this, this, this issue was um, in the focus of public attention. As you can see, uh, it's the issue of reforms uh, that were responding to the existing crisis of the Soviet system. And everybody said, but of course Gorbachev had to reform the Soviet Union. And of course the Soviet Union at that time was a sick man of the world, so to say. And uh, the only correct way to proceed was political liberalization and radical market reforms. What else? 
Um, and at the end, when the Soviet Union did fall apart in December 1991, uh, the conclusion of people who held uh, this view was, but of course it meant to fail because Gorbachev procrastinated, because he didn't implement those much needed uh, belated reforms in time. So economic situation deteriorated and contributed to the disintegration. Well, definitely I uh, would accept that Gorbachev's personality, or what I call in one of my books Gorbachev's enigma, the fateful personality of Gorbachev, played a huge role in what happened. We cannot, we cannot explain it here. I agree with my uh, mentor and friend, William Taubman, who spoke recently you know, uh, here in this hall um, and who uh, had uh, uh, published a wonderful uh, uh, biography of Mikhail Gorbachev. Without this per personality, you cannot explain uh, what happened to the Soviet Union. And yet, of course, Gorbachev was not the only actor. There were many actors who contributed to Soviet demise. So what can I say about this first view? If we can mo move one slide forward. Um, Gorbachev made fateful choices um, that, of course, meant to reform the Soviet Union, the Soviet economy, economy that was not in great shape. Everyone knew that there was a malaise of Soviet economy, productivity, efficiency. And yet, I would say those choices, instead of contributing to a uh, convalescence of the Sikh men of the world, that is the Soviet Union, contributed to its terminal disease. Uh, those uh, policies, among others, were first, he sanctioned economic reforms that produced decentralization of Soviet economy and economic resources. But he did it in such a way, without realizing it, by the way, uh, as well as all the economists who helped him on this task did not realize it, that the way it was implemented, this economic uh, decentralization produced the collapse of the old economy without creating a new economy. Instead of economic growth, it led to economic decline and disintegration. Second, he opted for political liberalization in the kind of neo-Leninist revival of Soviet representative institutions those congresses of people's deputies, those uh, uh, Soviet, uh, Soviets of people's deputies, uh, supreme Soviets of people's deputies were nothing less than um, neo-Leninist uh, institutions of, of the early 20s that Gorbachev hoped would bring more dynamism to the Soviet system. Instead, they aggravated the problem of governability. They uh, aggravated the problem of state capacity that was already created by the first choice, economic decentralization. And the third is a something we all know, Gorbachev refused to use force, to use violence to maintain uh, law and order, to maintain Soviet constitution, or to resume uh, uh, the capacity to restore the capacity of, 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 of governability that he had been undermining with the two previous choices. Uh, so all these choices, especially the way they were implemented under Gorbachev, produced runaway erosion of the party state structures, the catastrophic loss of state institutional capacities, rapid disintegration, separatism. A few words about economic reforms. And you can see I uh, do attribute great importance to economic decentralization. We know there were two key reforms that Gorbachev hailed and approved personally in 1987. In January, it was uh, Hosra Shoto, self-financing of <coughs> state enterprises. And state enterprises were basically the, the major unit of Soviet state planned economy. There were thousands upon thousands of state enterprises from huge factories that produced inter intercontinental ballistic uh, missiles, such as one in Ukraine, uh, to tractor factories, to I don't know, um, you know, barber shops. They all state enterprises. So the way uh, he proceeded it played a, a huge uh, role in in what 
subsequently happened to Soviet economy. And here we have an enigma, because it looked like initially Gorbachev wanted to follow China's model, or at least the model of uh, neo-Leninist uh, return to new economic policy of the 20s, more autonomy, more uh, uh, room for market uh, forces, but he ended up rather emulating, emulating Yugoslav and Hungarian experience where the market elements were introduced into the existing state plan economy. To simplify what happened, I would have an image of somebody planting the agents of destruction into the very heart of the old Soviet economy. Uh, and those agents of destruction were not, none, none else as directors of those state enterprises, um, various members of the Communist Party, and so on and so forth. I will later return to this uh, enigma to explain what happened. But just to remind what those reforms were about, the idea was for Gorbachev to return to the dream of his generation, to see those reforms interrupted by the crushing of the Prague Spring, by the Warsaw Pact in, in, in August 1968. It was Prague reforms uh, uh, and Kasigian reforms of the 60s and the Soviet Union aborted by uh, in 1968. It was a return to them uh, about 20 years later. What did I mean when I uh, mentioned Yugoslav and Hungarian economic experiments that uh, the Soviet economists uh, uh, emulated in the Soviet Union? They had suddenly state enterprises were able to elect their own directors. So instead of nom the no being nomenclature agents appointed from above in the vertical of power, suddenly thousands upon thousands of the heads of the state enterprises became autonomous. This autonomy was proclaimed on many levels. Um, they uh, could set up so-called cooperatives, and uh, loose the, cooperative, the law on cooperati cooperative was remarkably broad. It allowed to set up commercial banks. Uh, it, it allowed to have import and export uh, trade setups. So the Bolshevik monopoly on, on, on foreign trade established under Lenin in the first years of the Soviet power was all, all of a sudden suspended. What is all remarkable about those reforms was so far reaching and yet very few people understood what would be the consequences of these reforms. Uh, it somehow f was an impression or conviction in the mind of Gorbachev, his head of the government, Nikolai Rushkov, and a number of economists like Stepan Sitarian, Leonid Albalkin, and others, that somehow by giving more autonomy uh, to working enterprises, they uh, would ensure that more resources would be channeled into productivity, more uh, uh, money would be spent on innovation, and of course, quality goods would reappear some, some, and somehow and would be used for exporting them abroad and earning uh, precious currency. What happened instead was a totally opposite thing. Um, the state enterprises used their autonomy and money to boost salaries of the, uh, of, the, of the directors of the enterprise. They also transferred that cash, new cash, that they, instead of paying it in the form of taxes to the state, they all, all of a sudden had it on their, uh, on their budget in the form of non-cash, virtual money. They translated it into real cash through the uh, fixed system of, of enterprises, uh, uh, of fixed system of cooperatives, commercial banks, through international trade. So if you look at the first cohort of rich Russians in London, you find all of a sudden most of them appeared during late Gorbachev years. The first cohort of London uh, grad people began to arrive soon after Gorbachev's first reforms. And here, in, uh, if we look uh, a longer view in retrospect, we have the blueprints not of a new economy that is more productive and more efficient as Gorbachev probably hoped and expected. We have the blueprint of a new economy that we rightfully call today the kleptocratic economy, kleptocratic state in, uh, that of course reached its pinnacle 
uh, apogee in Putin's Russia. That goes back to Gorbachev's reform. In order to, uh, and of course, the second thing that uh, Gorbachev did, as I mentioned, was political liberalization and removal of the party from the process of economic and political change. It is all the more remarkable if we compare um, what Gorbachev did, for instance, to what uh, simultaneously was happening in China under Deng Xiaoping. A young historian, a young economic historian, Chris Miller, argued in his recent book, Saving the, the Soviet Economy, that Gorbachev used China's economic takeoff to shape Soviet debate about economic reform. But, Chris Miller argued, insuperable obstacles for Gorbachev was the enormous power of vested interests in Soviet economy. The military-industrial complex, agrarian lobby, and above all, the party nomenclature itself that clung to its privileges and didn't resist any changes. There's something enigmatic about this, and here I argue with, uh, with uh, uh, Chris and disagree, actually, with his conclusions. First of all, Gorbachev seemed to begin to talk about emulating China reforms, and then he could, uh, the, 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 the reforms that he implemented were not even remotely something that China did. What the Chinese did, they maintained above, they maintained the vertical of power. And they used the power of the party and the party cadres to control the forces that economic reforms unleashed. Yes, they, uh, they uh, authorized economic decentralization, but they authorized it in a way so that the system would not devour itself. Instead, the system began to work. The system uh, uh, contributed to immense economic growth of Chinese economy, up to 10% by the end of the 1980s. And at the same time, the multiplication of economic actors in China who had autonomy uh, to, to take decisions in what uh, Barry Norton uh, called a growing out of planned economy. So that those actors would be under control of the party. Then Xiaoping was not much about theory. He didn't even, to my knowledge, consult many economists, not to mention Western economists, but he knew two things. You have to decentralize economic decision making and give autonomy to multiple actors who would take rational economic choice, make rational economic choices, but at the same time, you have to retain control. You have to retain control over this process. What Gorbachev did was something abs uh, absolutely opposite and enigmatic. Gorbachev did what uh, Bulgarian historian Ivan Krastev recently in his lecture called trying to fix the system that didn't work and discarding the system that <laughs> could have worked. He tried to fix Soviet economy. That was basically should have been left to its own devices. Instead, a new economy based on market relations had to be built in parallel to the old economy. And he discarded this, the, the, the system that did work in many ways, the Communist Party. The Communist Party was the only system of maintaining control. So it is really amazing that in 1988, and particularly 1989, Gorbachev moved against the Communist Party. He did uh, several, uh, made several starting, startling reforms that removed uh, the Communist Party as an organization, not individuals, as the organization from the process of managing economy and from the process of economic reforms per se. Most notoriously, at the end of 1988, Gorbachev abolished those uh, uh, sectors, uh, departments of the, co uh, of the central communist apparatus that managed economic processes. At the same time, he didn't create any new mechanisms that maintain control over those economic actors and those economic forces that his reforms had unleashed. One guess is um, 
about Gorbachev's ma motivation, that Gorbachev had some kind of a dream to create a new party. That, that would be a par the communist party that had never existed, a neo-Leninist party of his imagination, probably ideally consisting of people like him. But he was quite unique, by the way. In some ways, he was a typical Soviet man. In many ways, he was unique. Um, so that party could not have occurred. What could have emerged was the Communist Party that would have been told in the words of another great Bolshevik, Bukharin, get yourself rich. And this is what essentially Deng Xiaoping did in China. He linked uh, the power of the communist nomenclatura to the ability to enrich themselves. And they quickly understood the message. Some people would could tell me that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was irreformable and consisted of some kind of die-in-the-wool individuals. I know the call of the world. It can wake even die-in-the-wool bureaucrats. It's a very powerful call not to be underestimated. The amazing fact that Gorbachev never used it. On the contrary, he removed the party. He was afraid that the presence of the party would jeopardize his economic reforms, those state enterprises, those cooperatives. And by doing that, he created an opposition in the party to his reforms. Instead of turning the party into a, an ally of marketization and capitalization, he made the party as an organization an enemy of that process. Having said that, I, I found many, many um, facts and a lot of evidence that individually, the members of the party and the members of the Young Komsomol League especially were very eager to participate in Gorbachev's reforms and they actually acted as, as rational economic actors. They immediately realized there's a new opportunity for uh, legal, semi-legal, but in any case, very quick uh, acquisition of state assets and translation of those state assets into cash and siphoning off of this cash to offshore accounts uh, from Switzerland to London and so on and so forth. So, um, and this argument actually undermines the thesis, uh, the, second, uh, the second thesis that I want to uh, introduce for your attention. If we go full, full, uh, Another slide forward. Second view is that the Soviet Union was a totalitarian party state and only its dismantlement was necessary to carry out much needed economic and political reforms. Party nomenclature, the military industrial complex, all managerial class were, are, all in, are all considered to be the irreformable, irredeemable enemies of the reforms that had to be done. It was the defeat of those forces, as some people believe, uh, in August 1991 when the botched, some people say comical, uh, I don't think it was comical at all, coup in August 1991 in Moscow, uh, after it failed, it cleared the road to reforms. But by then, the Soviet Union was doomed. I already began to actually to criticize this viewpoint because we have sociological specific evidence how many people, thousands of people from the party apparatus, from the Young uh, Com uh, Communist League, and even, yes, from the KGB and from the military industrial complex were eager to participate in the process of transition to, let's call it the, the proper name, capitalism. I have one personal recollection. When I was about to go to Stanford, I was called by a friend of my father who happened to be uh, a friend of director of big secret uh, military industrial enterprise in Moscow. And he said, oh, I have an errand for you. You know, you're going to Stanford? Yes. Can you meet there somebody from Hewlett Packard? <laughs> 
We have an offer for Hewlett Packard. We're prepared to do whatever Hewlett Packard wants. We have a secret plan, secret labs. We have top-notch e e you know, uh, e equipment that the KGB helped us uh, with to stolen from the West, and we do all these nice things to, to defeat Americans in the next war. But now the Cold War is over, so we want to cooperate. We want to make money together. I was stunned. I was young and naive. I thought you know, something really profound is happening in the Soviet military industrial complex if the director of a super secret enterprise, probably my, by all means a party member, member of the Communist Party, of course, he's making this startling suggestion completely uh, uh, outside the channels to somebody like me who had no status or no, no authorization to have any negotiations with anyone. But that was the spirit of the time. That was the spirit of the end of the 90s. Then uh, I think some people from the uh, Soviet military industrial complex were prepared to, to turn a nuclear submarine into a, a submerged hotel <laughs> or, 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 or off the shore of California. All kinds of crazy ideas were uh, uh, bandied around at the time just to show you how wrong how wrong is this idea that, you know, that was this totalitarian party state in 1989, 1990, and especially 1991. There were thousands, tens of thousands of new actors who no longer feared the Communist Party, who no longer feared the vertical of power, who no longer even, even feared the KGB. In fact, some KGB people, as we know, began to look for ways to translate that power into money at that time. We, of course, know that there were uh, enemies of Gorbachev's reforms, uh, such as, for instance, the head of the Military Industrial Commission, uh, Baklanov was, uh, was one of the uh, key participants of that botched coup, August coup in 1991. But looking in retrospect, what did Baklanov actually want? Why did he resist the reforms? One comes up, uh, with, an, or comes up with an impression that he was already seeing, seeing that the military industrial complex was being eroded by those internal agents of change. He was he began to fear that without state regimentation and regulation of reforms, those reforms would turn into what one political sci American political scientist, Stephen Solnik, called run on the bank. When members of the Communist Party, members of the military industrial complex understood the Soviet bank is crushing, whoever takes part of it, whoever you know takes part of the profits would be rich. Those who uh, procrastinate would end up with empty hands. So this was the process uh, unleashed by Gorbachev as early as 1987-88. Uh, In this sense, even, even the pinnacle of that democratic mythology or democratic saga of, of, of the story of the Soviet collapse, the August coup itself and the resistance that uh, Yeltsin and uh, democratic forces offered to the GKCP, the ugly name for, for uh, that the Putschists came, came up with, should be uh, reappraised and, and reconsidered. What did they want? Did they have any program, those coup makers? In fact, looking at it uh, through the documents that are available, and especially in retrospect, they didn't have any alternative to transition to market, to transition to capitalism. What they tried to offer was not a restoration of some kind of a totalitarian reality or some kind of a state-planned economy. That was an impossible dream already in 1991, considering political liberalization, considering the unleashing of all those uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of new actors uh, who, uh, who participated in this run on the bank. Um, that was completely unthinkable to stop. The only thing they probably expected to do is to uh, decelerate this process, to put a brake on this process, to introduce something that would resemble a Chinese way of controlling this process. But they were pathetic. Everyone knows it. And what's interesting that uh, 
Yegor Gaidar, who would soon become the main economist of uh, the radical reforms of Yeltsin, Yegor Gaidar uh, was finishing at the time a major, a major book uh, sitting uh, in his dacha near Moscow. And when he heard about the coup, uh, he uh, basically was just finished a chapter where he came to conclusion. The only, th the only thing that can save and can implement Soviet uh, uh, Soviet uh, reforms, Soviet movement towards the market would be drastic measures to restore state capacity. Gaidar came up with a startling metaphor for this restoration of state capacity. We need a Soviet Pinochet. Yes, we need a Soviet Pinochet, or at least a Soviet Deng Xiaoping. He looked, uh, he watched television, he saw those gray apparatchiks who staged the coup and immediately understood those are not the people who can be collectively or individually a Pinochet. At the end of the coup, he came to another conclusion that the only chance to have a real dictator, a real Pinochet that could carry out highly unpleasant economic reforms in the collapsing Soviet Union was Boris Yeltsin. So instead of this choice that we're accustomed to read about in, in textbooks about the, 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 the August School of 1991, the choice between totalitarianism and democracy, something that was deeply believed by many participants in the streets and the squares and heroic defenders of the White House, Economist Gaidar and some other reform, uh, economists at the time were thinking the real choice is to have Pinochet or not to have Pinochet. To have uh, somehow a, a, a regulated, managed transition to a, a market economy which would, which can only be done under conditions of um, authoritarianism. Or to have a descent to chaos. So in a sense, uh, I would say, uh, Democracy versus totalitarianism, the spirit of uh, the August uh, uh, resistance to the coup, and then Yeltsin's counter coup masked the real alternative that some economists understood very well. But of course, what is understood by economists is usually misunderstood by, by everyone else, so, as, as we all know. Um, Next uh, idea that I want to uh, discuss, if we can move, uh, move on, um, that I already discussed, so we can, we can move one more. Um, by the way, you know, this is, this is indeed uh, what, what succeeded in, in, in China and what failed in the Soviet Union. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, kept to, against all expectations, control over uh, complex economic forces, and Gorbachev lost uh, control over those forces. Uh, the primacy of economy does not mean, in this case, that everything was decided by economy, but much more was decided by uh, malfunctioning economy and the economic and financial crisis that misconstrued Gorbachev's reforms helped to unleash. Because, as you can understand, many more people would come out to the streets chanting down with communism, long live democracy, long live Yeltsin, when there's nothing to buy in state stores. And this was the case of the Soviet Union already in 1990 and, and especially in the early 1991, where the situation with, uh, uh, in grocery stores well, was much worse than even under, under Brezhnev. The next view, uh, please, uh, next slide. The next view that I want to discuss um, that was uh, popularized in a recent book by Sergei Plotky, very, very, very good book on, on the end of the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union was the last empire that was destroyed by Gorbachev's glasnost, revelations of communist crimes, and by political liberalization. Here, political liberalization is taken for granted as if Gorbachev had no other choice but to, to go in this direction. So um, these policies, as a view uh, uh, holds, gave the room to national liberation movement, first in the Baltics, 
and finally and decisively in Ukraine, and much of this excellent book by Sergei Plochi is devoted to the uh, surprisingly uh, prominent role that Ukraine played in the process of Soviet disintegration. I'm not going to argue with this, uh, uh, with this view, but I would rather complicate this view uh, by bringing to your attention uh, important uh, segments of realities that do not fit into this paradigm, into this matrix. Uh, in my opinion, I am even prepared to go as forward as to say uh, that the destruction of the Soviet Union as an act of national revolutions was only the surface of what was happening. The Baltic states, of course, were the place where a real, genuine national liberation movement took place. I'm not going to argue uh, that. So, but that it was rather the exception to the, uh, to, to the rule. And we all know that the decisive uh, act for the disintegration of the Soviet Union along national line was the rebellion of Russia. So if you please can move to the next uh, slide. The Russian revolt against the center. It came before Ukraine. Ukraine emulated it later on, the Ukrainian Republic. It, it came in the form of declaration of sovereignty in June 1990. What was that sovereignty? What did Russia mean, the largest huge republic controlling over 80% of Soviet uh, wealth and Soviet economic potential? What kind of sovereignty they were talking about? Who voted for that sovereignty? And we find a startling fact. Practically everyone uh, voted for the sovereignty in the newly elected Congress of People's Deputies of the Russian Federation. That's another new Leninist institution that was created as a result of remarkably free and unimpeded elections in, in the spring of 1990. And that was basically the creation of an alternative elite, an alternative political elite. Uh, many uh, radical Democrats who lost the battle in the old Union Congress of People's Deputies in 1989, lost the battle against the majority, more conservative majority, migrated to the Russian, uh, Russian Assembly and found a completely different audience there. There were mostly party officials, many intellectuals, surprising number of KGB officers ran and won elections in the Russian elections of 1990. Everybody knew they were KGB officers. They ran for elections with complete authorization of the, uh, of the KGB authorities. Yet all those people, with a few exceptions, voted for Russian sovereignty. Can you imagine hundreds of the KGB officers voting for the sovereignty of the Russian Federation against the Union? That's a true enigma. But the answer to this enigma is not in the spirit of Russian nationalism. You would, prob you would be wrong if you argue, oh, look, how all of a sudden that hidden wellspring of Russian nationalism came to the fore. In fact, you find that Russian nationalists with real pedigree were horrified by that declaration of sovereignty because they considered the entire Soviet Union, with some exceptions maybe of the Baltic, um, Western Ukraine as Russia, a big Russia. So they're horrified by that declaration. Many people couldn't understand what exactly happened. The explanation, however, was uh, hidden in the process of economic decentralization and run on the bank that Gorbachev had unleashed in 1987-88 it was as if a new provincial, more provincial, second-tier elite that formed as a result of the free elections in 1990 uh, made a claim, okay, we want to participate in this greatest heist in history. We want to have access to, sovereign, uh, to, to property. So sovereignty, if you ask many actors who voted for the act of sovereignty, was primarily expressed as an act of possession of economic enterprises under this jurisdiction of the center. So the war that began between the new rebellious Russia and the center was above all economic war, the war for economic assets. And the most uh, remarkable expression of this war was the war between the banks, 
the State Bank of the Soviet Union and uh, the newly empowered Bank of the Russian Federation. It was about control of resources. It was about control over who, who, would, uh, who would have control over economic resources. I think that game was perfectly understood by communist apparatchiks in Ukraine who followed this, this example uh, because they exactly understood what was at stake. How, how, how many state enterprises on the territory of Ukraine were under union or center's jurisdiction? They wanted those enterprises to be under their jurisdiction because by that time, some ministers of union economy already began to tell their friends, look, I'm like a Soviet Krupp. I'm like a Soviet Rockefeller. I'm like a Soviet Carnegie. I don't have the act of ownership, but I have much more important thing. I have possession, the act of possession of state property. Possession in Soviet and even in Russian conditions today is as valuable as legal act of property. So in general, um, in the conditions of the collapse of old institutional capacities and hierarchies, um, you may say that um, the disintegration of the union became, became, if not an inevitability, but probability. If I would choose between the two factors, the loss of state control over economic resources, and heroic struggle of people for national independence. I would definitely say that the disintegration of economic space and economic control was a much more important factor in the story of the Soviet collapse. I would leave uh, for discussion the last question here that occurred to me when I was preparing for this lecture with all this, you know, could this union have been preserved? Should, even more importantly, it have been preserved? Um, that uh, probably should be discussed not in the context of what was happening in 1990, 91, but in the context what began, what was happening after the Soviet collapse with all the costs and trials and tribulations and losses that followed the disintegration of one economic and political space. But um, I would like in the remaining time to bring your attention to the fourth theme, if we can move forward, um, about the role of external factors. And many people would say that the United States and the West almost did not play any role in the Soviet collapse particularly pointing to the Bush administration and particularly pointing to uh, the chicken Kiev speech that Bush gave in Kiev and was roundly criticized by uh, uh, Canadian Ukrainians and American Ukrainians as many of you who lived through those times remember. So if we uh, hold this view, um, we accept as truth the fact that, yes, the American administration supported the center against the republics um, until August 1991, and even after the coup made the Soviet Union and the power of Gorbachev basically a fiction, the U.S. administration helped to keep Gorbachev in power, and Yeltsin, oh boy, Yeltsin was eager to get rid of him already at the end of August, but the American administration stepped in and said, no, that wouldn't be the right decision, Mr. Yeltsin. Um, so in a sense, you may uh, argue that the United States helped for several months to maintain the fiction of this central authority until November when Bush in, uh, famously met with the Ukrainian delegation and said if Ukrainians vote for uh, independence in the referendum of December 1st, then the United States would recognize Ukraine. So. I would like to complicate this, this picture, and uh, again, uh, one, one uh, slide forward if possible. 
Um, I do uh, accept that the uh, collapse of communism in Eastern Europe in 1989 had a catalytic and powerful uh, spillover effect on the Soviet Union. That is beyond doubt. That particularly works for the Baltic uh, state the republics, that particularly wor wor worked for West Ukraine. At the same time, at the same time, we should not uh, look at the American role in, in the story of the Soviet collapse as a narrow narrative of how the Bush administration conducted diplomacy and uh, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Gorbachev and the Union and the republics. That, that that's of course, is the tip of the iceberg, but it's not the whole iceberg. The Bush administration, indeed, to qualify what I already said, uh, instead of supporting the center, rather played, uh, rather conducted the policy of disengagement or relative disengagement from the Soviet affairs until August 1991. That would be more correct way of uh, describing its policy. And in this, well, this, this disengagement was explained very simple among the members of the administration. Uh, what can we do? The Soviet Union is a huge country hobbled by bad history, uh, by the culture we don't understand. Uh, no matter what we do, we cannot change the course of history. Basically, if they, if they collapse, they will collapse. Nothing we can do about it. No matter how much money we contribute to this process, all this money will go into the rat hole. Nothing can be done. They began engage, to engage uh, uh, in, into the process of, uh, of, of Soviet disintegration after August on one major premise. Not one, but one was especially uh, serious concern. They were afraid, watching Yugoslavia going down the path of bloody war, that there would be a nuclear Yugoslavia emerging in this giant country. And the question of nuclear safety and protection of American people figured very prominently in the internal deliberations uh, of, of the Bush administration. However, when we look at uh, the role of the United States and in general on American attitudes towards the Soviet Union at the time, um, it's, it's a much more complex story that goes well beyond the back channels and internal deliberations of a few government officials. Well, those of us who lived through that time remember that there were, was a lot of sympathy for Gorbachev, a lot of sympathy for his reforms, wonderful warm feelings towards those people who defended the White House against the, the tanks in August 1991. And that one may call one trend in American public opinion, a remarkable trend that some, some of us uh, who lived there would just shake our, hand, uh, shake our heads in disbelief watching today's situation in the Russian-American relations. Times change. But at the same time, it's important to recognize that the United States in 1990, 1991, was the country that was on the other side of the Cold War divide for decades from the Soviet Union. Yes, the support of Gorbachev was on the rise in 1990, 89 even, 1990, uh, but Americans still lived with the memories of the Cold War. The Cold War became the biggest rationale for America to be a world leader, to be a world empire, to shed this so quickly during the process of just three years or two years was unimaginable and unthinkable. So one should not be surprised to find in, in the Bush administration and in a much broader circles uh, within the Beltway in Washington and elsewhere, people who would uh, say, hey, it's still, there's still the totalitarian empire. Bob Gates famously uh, uh, argued that uh, Gorbachev was trying to deceive us in 1989. 
Bush himself, even at the time of the Gulf War uh, uh, in 1990, 91, believed that you know it's important to maintain, to keep the United States on guard against possible resurrection of evil forces in the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union, even when he was in death throes, was regarded by many people inside and outside the administration as just, you know, as a country that could go back to evil ways. Of course, Gorbachev is a wonderful person. Of course, but he's just one person. We don't know, you know, they were not even sure what Yeltsin would do when he comes to power. Maybe he would become the Russian czar. Maybe he would become a Russian nationalist czar. Who knows? So uh, in the Pentagon, especially people like R Dick Cheney, Paul Wolfowitz, in the administration at large, Bob Gates, uh, Robert Darman, Nicholas Brady, um, they believed that if the Soviet Union would fall apart, it would be in, in the best interest of the United States. You know, using famous analogy with Germany, we love Germany so much we want many Germanies, right? Some people will say, well, let it be as many Russians, uh, Russians as possible. It's, you know, the smaller Russia becomes, the better it would be in terms of strategic interests of the United States. So you had that trend as well. That trend was maybe partially in decline and the trend of generosity and good feelings was on the rise, but both trends definitely co coexistence. And, and the importance of that second trend, down with the evil empire, down with totalitarianism, is really fascinating. Because here we have an, an interesting phenomenon when in Washington and outside Washington, you have such groups as Heritage Foundation, Endowment for Democracy, Moral Majority, and others, who um, supported, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, the struggle of national liberation movements in the Baltics and Ukraine and stood for dismemberment of the Soviet Union. And those people uh, found support among Russian radical politicians that grouped around Yeltsin. We know that those politicians, people like Gennady Bourbolis uh, and others, uh, Foreign Minister Andrei Kozarev, believed that uh, it was no longer possible to do any uh, radical economic reforms within the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was too big and unmanageable. And all, all the more, they believed that the Soviet Union was irreformable. There was a whole list of reformable things that uh, Borbalis and, and Kozarev, and ultimately to an extent Yeltsin himself, believed in. The Soviet Union was irreformable, the Communist Party was irreformable, the KGB was irreformable, the managerial class was irreformable, and so, so on, so long down the list. Then you ask, what was reformable? Um, so um, we find that uh, these people found their allies as in a s some, some kind of uh, almost a, a epistemic community among the right-wingers of the Republican Party. That was a strange mixture, as always, of libertarians and you know, libertarian billionaires, There's some moral majority guys like Paul Weirich, and you know, it was a wide assortment of individuals. Um, that just not so that you would uh, recall those days, I would quote from the famous Chicken Kiev speech by William Sapphire. Whereas William Sapphire, in late August, after the failure of the coup, attacked the, the, the super cautious policy of the Bush administration with utmost eloquence. Um, I'm quoting, the Soviet empire is breaking up. This is a glorious moment for human freedom. We should savor that moment, thanking God, NATO, the heroic dissidents in Russia, and the internal empire, and the two-generation sacrifice of the American people to protect themselves and the world from despotic domination. We should seize this moment, too, to urge our new comrades and freedom over there in Russia, to use the counter-coup momentum against Gorbachev, to destroy the institutions and bring down the elite that oppressed them. That is a downright call for the regime change and the change of elites complete change of elites. And that call was supported on both sides. In Washington, not by the Bush administration. Bush was very offended by uh, 
by Sapphire's article, uh, but by many people from the Reagan administration, Nixon administration, who always held Bush in contempt, as Chicken Kiev's speech basically did. Um, so Borbalis, Kozarev, Yeltsin regarded those people their allies, not the Bush administration. What it led to, uh, it led to a strange development that I would call um, the drama of mutual misunderstanding. Here I'm not arguing that the United States contributed, uh, was a crucial force in causing Soviet disintegration. I have to be very careful here. I'm not arguing this. By no means. The record of the Bush administration is almost impeccable in this respect. Not that it prevents Russian nationalists today from attacking Americans, but the record shown by the archives is almost impeccable. I'm not even arguing that epistemic community that emerged between the right-wing Republicans, uh, libertarians, and anti-communists, and so on and so forth uh, in, on the American side, and guys like Yeltsin, Borbalis, and Kozarev played a crucial role in the story of Soviet disintegration. I think I spoke long enough to give you an idea who destroyed the Soviet Union. Gorbachev himself, Nikola, Nikolai Rushkov, and the economic reforms, uh, political, political liberalization, and so on and so forth. But what is interesting here is to reverse slightly the equation when we talk about the American factor in, in the story of Soviet collapse. We usually ask a question, what did the United States do or didn't do at that time? And we may say, oh, they didn't provide the grand, grand bargain. Oh, they didn't provide the Marshall Plan. Or they did something else. Um, in, I would say we should reverse this equation and ask, what did actors in the Soviet Union, just like actors in Eastern Europe two years earlier, thought they should do that the United States wanted. And then that become, then becomes a much more interesting historical inquiry because there were many actors in the Soviet Union who believed in 1990 and especially in 1991 that the United States actually wanted them to destroy the totalitarian empire and once they do it, once they accomplish this feat, then the United States would come up with a Marshall Plan. Then the United States would offer a generous hand to Russian people and would help Russia to go through troubled times and so on and so forth. So then the story becomes the story of tragic misunderstanding. In the case of the Bolts, it's much more straightforward. The Bolts actually told Americans, hey, you never recognized our annexation by Stalin, so live up to your, to your words. I mean, now you have really recognized us. This is an opportunity for you, to, for you to do. Even in the case of Ukraine, you know, it may be argued that the United States did it under the pressure of Ukrainian diaspora, but, you know, it, it is a straightforward, a straightforward thing. In case of Yeltsin and many Russian Democrats, it's a story of delusion. They were under impression that they played a leading key role in the destruction of Soviet communism, and yes, the Soviet Union itself. Russia did play the key role in the destruction of the Soviet Union. And they expected something to happen after that that never meant to happen. That sowed the seeds of future frustration and disillusionment that we continue to see to, 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 to this day. Uh, in American imagination, uh, I would say not only in the imagination of Dick Cheney and Wolfowitz and other people of that kind, um, but in, a, in the imagination of a broader uh, segment of people in the United States, Russia as a democracy was something like an oddball. This is something like a contradiction of terms, right? So um, any attempts by the Russian Democrats, as they call themselves, after August of 1991 to say, hey, we are the biggest Democrats on the block. You must recognize we have a duty to spread democracy to Ukraine, where communists still rule, to Central Asia, where communists still rule, and so on and so forth. The United States was not sure it was a great idea. 
to give Russia any sphere of responsibility, be it, be it for liberal democracy or for anything else. So um, finally to the last uh, in concluding slide. Preliminary conclusions. This is definitely the story in progress. And above all, it's not a case closed. All these held views that I tried to elaborate, some of them may look a little bit to some of you who know about that story as a as kind of a straw man. Uh, they're not straw men. There are many people who believe in those things. But as I try to demonstrate each of that deeply held view, particularly in the West, falls apart under the weight of complicated evidence. The second thing that uh, I want to say, and this is not sufficiently understood and appreciated, that this, the, the story of the Soviet Union did not end in December 1991. The Soviet Union continued to live, even in decapitated, in, 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 in disemboweled shape, uh, continued to live, as lived the problems that the rapid dissolution of, of the center caused. Above all, as we can see in the story of Russian-Ukrainian relations, because the manner in which the Union was dissolved, and yes, Yeltsin and, and Kozarev and Burbulis takes credit for doing it peacefully, for avoiding a nuclear Yugoslavia, for avoiding a Russian-Ukrainian conflict, but we see immediately in the first days after the coup, the origins of, of a Russian-Ukrainian conflict, the uh, attempts to revise the border between Russia and Ukraine, Crimea figuring very prominently as something that must belong to Russia and cannot stay in Ukraine. The future of the Black Sea Fleet brought up immediately in the first days, weeks, and months after, after the Soviet collapse. So, the failure of scholarship to appreciate that connection between the rapid, unprepared, un, uh, unmanaged uh, Soviet dissolution and subsequent problems, this failure can no longer be pardoned. There must be a greater, a greater attention to this problem. Um, also, as I try to argue in this talk, theories, are uh, nice things, but reality always defeat theories. So if anyone believes that the only way the Soviet Union could proceed was through uh, liberalization, a road to democracy, uh, dissolution of the lost empire, at least these convictions sh must be questioned and uh, readdressed. I'm not arguing that the old Soviet Union could have been preserved. What I'm arguing is by 1990, 91, it was not the old Soviet Union. It was all kinds of opportunities in motion. It was kind of roads not taken that could have probably been taken. And the, re the retaining state capacity over traumatic reforms, gradual transformation of the old union into a real commonwealth, not in the rapid way it happened, not in the dramatic way it happened, could have saved us a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, fuel and uh, probably even could have saved lots of lives. It was not all that bloodless, after all, particularly after we uh, saw the conflict between Russia and Ukraine lately. Finally, uh, I think it's important to take the story of the Soviet collapse uh, as a response to the uh, emerging and intensifying history and memory wars that rock today Eastern Europe, Ukraine, Russia, uh, a large part of the post-Soviet space. To turn this uh, into the angry debate between deaf and mute is one way. One side could say, you know, the empire was doomed. We don't want to hear about any argument. The other side, uh, Russian nationalists, whatever, could say, no, empire had to be saved. It's not a productive way to approach this. Uh, but 
complex uh, realization of complexity, reconsideration of Soviet collapse, uh, open-mindedness about new factors that do not feel, uh, fit old paradigms and history, I think will prepare us more to respond to both sides in this mutually damaging and potentially dangerous conflict about the past. Thank you.